It is 9 a.m. now, so let's get started. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Prepare Your Farm for Tax Season Now. Your speakers today will be Florencia Colella and Corey Clark. We are farm business management educators with Michigan State University. I am Florencia. My pronouns are she or hers, and I am multiracial. Corey, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Corey Clark. Uh, my pronouns are she or hers, um, and I'm glad to be here today. Thank you. Okay, I want to switch slides. Um, and before we start, we would like to uh, show you our civil rights slide and also acknowledge that MSU occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ordabwa, and Potawatomi peoples that was ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. Um, farmers have been keeping records for 11,000 years. So we hope this tidbit and knowing that we have a group of uh, nine people on the webinar as of now, um, to encourage you that the, to feel that the work that you do matters. So without further ado, let's get started. And we will start with a question of whether you are running a commercial farm. You can find the Internal Revenue Service IRS definition of a farmer on the cover of the Farmer's Tax Guide, which is the IRS publication 225. If you don't have this guide already, I suggest you download it from the IRS website. The link is here or you can just Google it. In a few words, it defines a farmer as someone who operates a farming business with the intent of making a profit. The full definition is here on the slide. Um, but on another hand, an activity could be considered to be a hobby by the IRS. And this is if it's primarily for fun, recreation, or sport without any intention of making a profit. The IRS will presume a farming activity is being conducted for profit if it produced a profit in at least three out of the fa past five year, fa five tax years, including the current one. Equine operations are the exception with a presumption of profits in at least two out of seven years. If this test is not met, it doesn't automatically mean that the activity is a hobby for the IRS. Instead, they will consider other criteria, including the ones on the slide, the extent to which the activity is conducted in a business-like manner, the expertise, time and effort spent, so you should keep track of that, the expectation uh, there may be of assets used in the activity to appreciate in value, as in just investing for real estate purposes, not farming purposes, um, et cetera. You can just read them from there. There are no minimum income amounts though. So that's another thing you should take into consideration. Okay, so why does this matter? Any income from a hobby farm is reported on the first page of the U.S. Individual Income Tax Return or Form 1040 under other income and it is taxable. You used to be able to deduct hobby farm expenses to the extent of the farm's income, but that is not the case anymore. So you will be taxed on your hobby farm's gross income independently from any expenses you may have incurred. On the other hand, income from a commercial farm is reported on Schedule F, which is an attachment to Form 1040, and its expenses are deductible, even if they go above income. So if your commercial farm operates at a loss in some years, those losses can be used to offset your overall income tax liability. Of course, this makes it convenient for you to call your farm a commercial farm, but can you prove your farm is a business? If you are audited, the IRS will look at whether you can prove that your goal is to make money from farming. The good news is that the practices needed to show the IRS that you are in farming for its potential profit, even if you aren't making money right now, are the same good practices that will eventually make your business a successful one. So this is a list of things that the IRS will look at. Note that the fourth is keeping records. Being a hobby farmer or homesteader are great lifestyle choices too, and they may fit your specific situation better. We just hope that these tips will help you prepare for tax season, whatever your income sources or lifestyle choices are. 
So next we are going to dive into record keeping. We said that in order for farm businesses to even be considered businesses by the Internal Revenue Service, they need to have accounting records. There are two main accounting met methods, accrual and cash. So the IRS allows farm businesses to use either method, uh, which is not the case for all types of businesses. But once you pick one, you are required to get their approval to switch back. Under the accrual method of accounting, you report income in the year it was earned or due, even if the payment was not collected. Um, expenses are similarly deducted or capitalized in the year they were incurred, not necessarily made. For example, if you used an item to grow a crop, for, uh, for example, you would account for it even if you haven't actually paid for it to your supplier yet. One good thing about the accrual method is that it matches income and expenses for a certain production year, providing a more accurate assessment of profit. This assessment of profit is often shown in what's called the income statement. On the other hand, the accrual method is less flexible in terms of tax management. It requires more time and information, and it may result in paying taxes on anticipated revenue. Most farmers use the cash method because they find it easier and are able to better match farm cash flows with the taxes due. Under the cash farm method, income is reported in the year it is credited to your bank account and expenses are deducted in the year the tax, in the tax year the expenses actually paid. However, a cash-based income statement does not reveal true profit. Thankfully, you can convert the cash-based income statement to an accrual or adjusted or true income statement by adding or subtracting year-end inventory adjustments for grain, feed, livestock, receivables, and payables to your income and expenses for the year. And you do this on an annual basis. So uh, since you do it on an annual basis, it saves you some time instead of doing the accrual method all throughout the year. But if all of this sounds complicated, you can get help for all of this free of charge from these folks here who are MSU Extensions Farm Business Management Educators. You will, though, need to have all the information for the year first. So here you have me to the left and Corey to the right and a lot of other great folks throughout the state. Um, but so business transactions are normally first recorded in a journal fashion. And once entered in the journal, transactions are usually grouped by account and summarized in a general ledger, showing a balance for each account. Oh, and by the way, do you know what is a chart of accounts? It is a sometimes long list of different categories that you need to keep track of. Not all may apply to you, but here to the left, there's a list of income accounts and to the right, there's a series of expense accounts. And while not pictured here, there is also asset equity and liability accounts that you should also keep track of. So while accounting may seem complicated at first, there are many tools you can use and many of them are free of charge. Here's just a few examples. You could keep pictures of your receipts instead of paper ones, which is where Google Drive, Google Photos, or OneDrive and Office Lens come in handy. If you choose to use an electronic storage system, you may destroy the original hard copies as long as the IRS is able to determine your correct tax in the case of a tax audit. For keeping track of transactions, there are plenty of applications you can download on your phone or use on your computer. Total, Mint, and Wave are just a few examples of free applications. I believe all banks these days also give you access to Excel records of your transactions. And of course, apart from Excel, there is Google Sheets, the Google version of Excel. So another option is just why not use good old paper and pen? Any of these will be better than a shoebox of discolored receipts at the end of the year. So I want briefly to introduce you to the Farm Records Book for Management that you can use to enter your transactions on paper. It is available for $15 on the MSU Extension online bookstore, or you can also get it for an extra fee from your local extension office. We're working on translating this into Spanish as well. 
I actually have to say that once they add the shipping charges, it ends up being more expensive than, than that, about like $25. So if that's too expensive for you, there are other options and I'll tell you about those. Here's a picture of the booklet. And if you prefer to work on the computer, you can go to bit.ly forward slash farm records book on your computer browser and access the farm records book just free of charge. Then you can either print it at home, download it to Excel, or use it right into Google Sheets. I'll show you how to do this in detail later. But the farm records book is basically a set of tables where you can enter your transactions by date in different categories. It is organized the same way income taxes are. So a benefit is that it makes tax filing easy, whether you are doing it yourself or are using a tax preparer. On another hand, the farm records book was designed to be simple. So it does not have formulas in there. Um, it's up to you if you want to add formulas or just add, add up things right using a calculator. If you are into formulas or a bit more complex spreadsheets, you can try the Farm Cash Tracker, which you can find in this link here. The Farm Cash Tracker has a few benefits over the Farm Records book, and it's also free of charge. The good thing is that it lets, it lets you copy and paste reports straight from your bank or application websites. Um, it lets you work with several different cash and checking accounts. So for example, if you sometimes transfer money be between different bank accounts or want to keep track of movements between cash and bank accounts, the Farm Records book does not have an easy way to do that. Well, this one, this one does. This is because it uses a double entry system. That's why you see incoming and outgoing account columns here to the right. This is as opposed of a single entry system like the farm records book where each entry is treated as if the offsetting account was the cash account, which may not always be true. This uh, cash tracker also has a summary page that will summarize your transactions per month and as a year total and give you net income and cash flow information among other things. So speaking about record keeping system, if you think you are ready for a paid record keeping system, something more sophisticated, I recommend the Telfarm program in which for only $550 per year, you get all of these things. The most important of which being, in my opinion, the fact that they review and back up your work, but there's also tax benefits and a lot of education. And we are piloting QuickBooks with this program. Um, and we've been working with PC Mars, which is another record keeping software designed specifically for farms for a very long time. Um, so if you're interested in a record keeping uh, software or a record keeping program, I suggest you look into this. So the first and most important financial management tool available to you is your records. With three to five years worth of records, either past or potential, you can analyze virtually anything on your farm, even productive matters, and make truly confident decisions. So we are now going to switch to Corey. I will stop sharing for a minute. I will share. Okay, have we got the presentation? Yes. Okay, are you ready to go or would you like to take another second, Florencia? Mm, I think we can just keep going. Okay. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm Corey Clark. I am a farm business management educator with Florencia actually. And I cover the, my general region or primary region is the thumb area. Um, and so we're gonna take a walk today through farm record keeping for taxes. And this stuff will apply no matter the record keeping system you use. So the paper record keeping system, such as the farm records book, which we'll talk about how the principles of farm record keeping apply to the farm records book, but it also would work for some of the free accounting systems, the cash tracker or software like PC Mars, Quicken or QuickBooks. Um, and so usually when we think about farm record keeping, we're thinking about like, how do we keep good enough records so we can file our taxes? Um, but I think we really need to kind of flip that around and say, well, how do taxes work? 
And then how do we design our record keeping system so that it works for us as businesses as well as meets the needs for, um, for tax records. Okay, tax records are complicated. This is just some of the forms that many farms will need to file. Uh, returns can be, you know, five pages, 10 pages. I've seen returns of 50 pages or longer, but here's the thing. Your tax preparer is going to use your farm information to complete all these forms. You don't actually have to do this all yourself. And if you use a tax preparer, you don't have to know all the forms. What you have to do is provide the tax preparer with the information that they need to complete your tax return. So farm records don't actually have to be that complicated. You do need a complete set of records um, that has all the transactions. So all everything where funds go in and out of the business uh, and with all the important details, but there's only four places where funds come in and out of the business. There's operations, so income from selling your products or services, expenses you pay to produce those products or services, Assets, so you purchase assets to produce your income, like equipment or land. Um, and then there's funds that might come in when you sell assets. There's debt. You might take out loans to purchase those assets or maybe a seasonal operating loan. And then you would make payments to pay um, those loans periodically. And finally, you might take funds out of the farm for family living expenses, or you might be contributing farm funds into the farm to make sure that it has enough cash. So I've put these categories into a table so that we can connect the cash in and cash out of the business with the taxes that will ultimately be paid for and by your farm business. Green funds are in. Red funds, I'm sorry. Red funds are cash going out of the business. So of course, farm operations is income and expenses. That's pretty straightforward, right? Um, funds come in from operating income, funds go out for operating expenses. And then assets, assets sold, bring cash into the business. And when you purchase them, cash moves out of the business. And then debt to purchase the assets. When you borrow the funds, it brings cash in and paying off the debt takes cash out. And finally, family living. If the farm contributes money to the farm, if the family contributes money to the farm, that is cash into the business because it's a contribution from the family into the business or if funds are withdrawn from the farm for the family that is cash out of the business. And so now we're going to connect this to taxable income and deductions um, and also point out what's not tax related. We'll go through the same ins and outs but related to how it um, impacts taxes. So income and expenses, right? Taxable farm income, ordinary income, uh, farm expenses are deductible expenses. And this assumes that you're a commercial farm and we are, we're are we working with that assumption all the way through this, this presentation. And then taxes on asset purchases and assets sold. A little more complicated than farm income expenses. Um, for example, even though you take cash in from an asset sale, only the gains on that asset are taxable. And likewise, you purchase the whole asset often at once and then the depreciation expense is spread over time um, as an expense on that purchase. And depreciation has a wide range of choices, and we'll all talk, we'll talk about some of that in detail later. And then debt, when you bring cash into the business by borrowing funds or cash goes out by paying the funds, neither one of those are tax related, but the interest paid is an interest expense, which is a deductible expense for your farm. And then finally, uh, funds that flow in and out of the business for family contributions and withdrawals, they don't affect taxes at all. Um, now, personal income and expenses can be really important for taxes, taxable wages, um, health insurance. There are things that you might use those funds for that have um, tax implications. And that'll come up in the next discussion. But how those personal funds interact with you interact with your farm is not a tax issue, and how they interact with taxes is not a farm issue. So the Form 1040, the first page of it, calculates your adjusted gross income. And that is derived from um, the your personal wages and your social security, as well as how the farm um, impacts the adjusted gross income. The farm, um, 
contributes net farm income, right? So that's the your operating income minus your operating expenses and also interest and depreciation. And then there's capital gains income, which has to do with the gains on the asset sales. So let's go back to how farm transactions relate to the taxes before we get into some of the details. We talked about how the farm generates taxable income and tax deductions. And we noted that farm debt um, does not impact taxes except for the interest and how family living withdrawals and contributions don't have implications directly for farm taxes. Um, I'm going to flip these around, these rows around because it'll make our discussion a little smoother. So notice the arrows and I flip those rows and they're trading places. Um, so every transaction that you make from checkings and savings and whatever cash accounts you're using with the business, a complete set of farm records has all the transactions fit in to one of these, into this table in one of the boxes. Um, and it's super important to keep those accounts reconciled so that you know that you've accounted for all of the transactions of the farm. But only the transactions in the purple box, which you can kind of barely see, um, have an impact on farm taxes. So not debt principal, for example. Um, and like I said, some of the personal um, expense, personal items that you might take funds out of the business for um, as a sole proprietor, for example, or a partner, um, they could have tax implications, but they're not about the farm taxes. So this is the table that we're gonna work with for the rest of the time, because every transaction that affects farm taxes are located somewhere in this table. So two main schedules that cover um, these types of income and expenses. They are the Schedule F, which involves the net farm income, and the Schedule D. And the Schedule F here, both of those, actually both of those flow through to the 1040 and your adjusted gross income. The Schedule F accounts for your net farm income. So if the farm income contributes to it, less the expenses, operating expenses, interest, and depreciation. And then Schedule D takes account of those gains on asset sales or those capital gains. Um, and these get treated a little bit differently than the Schedule F items, um, which we'll go through. But the idea is that the Schedule D income also flows to the 1040 to your adjusted gross income. Okay, let's tackle the Schedule F, how the Schedule F works first. Um, and one section at a time, farm income and expenses. So Florencia talked about the farm accounting methods and farms typically do use the cash method of accounting. So income is recognized when the payment is available to you and expenses are deducted when they're submitted to the vendor. Um, and this means that you can carry things over from the previous year. You might have income that you're from products you're selling in 2021 um, that was really produced in 2020. And likewise, you might prepay expenses in 2021 for next year, which offers you some opportunities to manage your taxes, both your cash actually and your taxes. And then products you sell. So um, crops, livestock, any other products, the big thing is about whether they are purchased or raised. Um, so like feeder cattle, uh, for example, the feeder cattle are not an expense until you sell the finished cattle. And so the purchase price is actually included up here in the income section. Whoa, there we go. Um, raised products, it's helpful to separate those out in your records because they're gonna go on a different line of the Schedule F. Then rental income. So rental income, uh, if you rent out lands or buildings, you have rental income. Normally rental income is not farm income. It actually goes on a Schedule E, which of course is, is separate um, and not subject to self-employment tax. But if you material, materially participate in farming on the rented land, then the farm income does go on the Schedule F and it is part of your farm income. And then there's additional sources of income. There's custom hire, for example, which may be providing services um, on for another farm or for another person. Um, crop insurance, you might have a claim on crop insurance. They may take out um, your your um, premium as a deduction, but the full amount of the claim is the source of your income. CCC loans get a little tricky. That's something you would want to talk about with your tax 
your tax professional, um, government payments, primarily payments that are directly to the farm. There is a variety of different payments with a variety of different tax implications. Um, again, talk with your tax professional. Cooperative distributions are usually patronage dividends and the amount you receive in cash, um, it may or may not be taxable income. It usually is clear on your form that you receive. Um, so you wanna have that form 1099 for your tax professional. And then there's a catch-all line for other income, which might be in something like hedging gains. Okay, so I wanna relate this stuff to the farm record book. Um, and it provides a place to record all of your income, expenses, debt, and asset transactions. So when you are recording an income transaction, um, you definitely need the date, item, buyer, and what you, uh, and the amount of what, uh, the dollar amount of what you sold. Um, the buyer might matter because you may have to look up um, the buyer later if it matters. It may matter if the buyer was a cooperative, for example. But all these are the columns uh, with the green bar above it. So for example, this June 26th sale of corn, you would have filled in the item corn, the buyer whoever purchased the corn. Okay, and then in the remaining columns, you'll identify the quantity and where it will go on the Schedule F. There's a column for pretty much every um, item. The, enti this, the entire Schedule F is represented by one of the columns. Uh, and you put the appropriate income in that appropriate column. Um, so if you sold 1,000 bushels of corn at $4 a bushel, you'd put 1,000 in the quantity column, bushels in the quantity measure, and $4,000 in the corn column. So when something is deducted um, straight from your gross sales, you need both section 2A of the farm record book and section 1A of the farm record book. Or in your um, accounting system, you need to ad address both the income and the expenses. The gross sale or the total sale goes in the income section um, of the farm records book or your accounting records. But then the deduction, which has come out of the gross sale, goes in the expense section. And then I was talking about um, purchases, items that are purchased or items that are produced, purchases that you've made for resale, um, those are not deductible. Uh, the expenses are not deductible until you sold the, the, um, the product. And so you need to track both. You need to record the sale in the income account and then the purchase, you record the purchases in the expense account and you're ultimately gonna match those up. What you purchased, so that you can deduct the expense when you sell the, the, your finished product. Um, so purchase feeder cattle, cattle livestock sold, um, you can use that for anything resale, and that's one of the columns in the income section. And then there's a column in the expenses section for things that were purchased for resale. So let's shift our attention to expenses. Um, we talked about operations generating expenses. There's about 15 lines of operating expenses on the Schedule F, and this should really drive your categorizing of those expenses. Um, as far as the specifics, we'll go through some of those in a minute, and then we'll talk about interest expense that's associated with debt payments and depreciation expenses that is associated with asset purchases. Um, so here's some of the specific lines that um, have some specific details that are important to know. Repairs and maintenance, um, they're on like line 25. The um, expenses on the Schedule F are in alphabetical order. And auto, car, truck, maintenance type things, those need to be recorded separately from farm equipment. So like your expenses, if you have the total expenses on, say, a car, and you use the car 50% for business use, then 50% of those expenses are ultimately tax deductible farm expenses. Whereas farm equipment, when that's repaired and maintained, that is a farm expense. Um, equipment leases, this is a tricky one. Only operating leases are um, deductible as operating expenses. The longer term leases where you might be buying the piece of equipment at the end or where that's expected, um, those are treated like a loan, and I highly recommend talking to your tax professional about that. And then taxes. Only certain kinds of taxes are deductible as farm expenses. So real estate taxes, which should be itemized if you're using a program like PA116. Uh, payroll taxes, like employees, so the 
employer contribution of Social Security and Medicare, and then personal property taxes is on the Schedule F, but not really a thing in Michigan. Um, so not estate taxes, not personal income taxes, um, and self-employment tax, which is calculated for the 1040 or calculated separately, that's not um, a farm expense on the Schedule F. Insurance, there are certain kinds of insurances that are deductible. Crop insurance is de deduct deductible. Um, property and casualty, ins casualty insurance for the farm and liability insurance. Health insurance for you as an owner and for your family, provided you're a sole proprietorship or a partnership, um, those are not deductible as a farm expense. But it is an adjustment to income on the Form 1040. So again, some of the things that don't belong on the Schedule F are still, still should be accounted for so you can use them in other places on your taxes. Um, also, life insurance is generally not deductible at all. So the, the labor expenses, there's two kinds of labor. There is your W-2 labor, which are your employees, and your contract labor, which would ultimately, some of them anyways, would get a Form 1099 and EC. Um, the W-2 labor has some different lines in the Schedule F. Contract labor, much simpler, but there is a lot of rules about what can be considered 1099 labor. Um, for employees, you pretty much can deduct everything you spend on them. Their gross wages are a payroll expense, your employer portion of Social Security and Medicare, and sometimes unemployment tax. Um, their withholdings are not a farm expense, uh, but all, but any of the and benefits you provide for them, employer contributions to retirement accounts, employer paid health insurance, those are farm expenses. And sometimes there's tax credits for providing particular benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's a page in the farm record book to account for all of these different transactions. Um, important to note, owner labor is not a deductible expense. So when you're working on the farm, that is not um, deductible for a sole proprietorship and usually not in a partnership for those particular business entities. It's different for an S corporation or a C corporation. So we made it to the bottom line, the net farm income. And this is the number that flows through to the form 1040. Keep in mind, this is calendar year profits. Um, so this is for taxes, whereas like Florencia was talking about, your management numbers um, are different than this. It requires a bit more work. That's the kinds of things, that analysis of the kinds of things we do. And the Farm Records Book does keep, um, does keep expense records. Um, first, you need to check information, the date, vendor, amount, check number. And then you also keep track of the category um, with this with the farm records book in the columns. And then from before, you have the purchases for resale and um, the quantity and total purchase price are here in the middle. Interest from debt payments. All right. Um, a little bit, not quite as straightforward, but also a tax deduction. And then principal, of course, not a tax deduction. Um, interest is down in these lines at the bottom, the line 21, um, and it separates out real estate mortgages from farm equipment and operating loans. Um, so you need to record in your records what kind of loan or what loans that applied to so that your accountant, your, your um, tax preparer can identify that. So again, when you do your loan information um, for an interest portion of the payment transaction date, creditor, loan description, beginning loan balance. Um, so you can match all these things up. Now, the, um, the farm record book is going to track your principal and then your interest portion and then an end balance. Um, the software will do that a little bit differently, but also keeps track of the principal and interest portions of your loan payment so that you can then deduct the interest expense. You will probably get a 1099, a form 1099 from the lender, and that is also important for the tax, for when you're preparing your taxes. Um, in the new loan column, you would have operating loan borrowing, which may be one time, maybe a rolling line of credits. Um, and then with equipment or mortgage loans, you would borrow usually one time and it's part of the um, purchase transaction. One of the important things about the purchase transaction is that the total amount of the purchase will go on the asset section and then the loan amount goes here. 
And finally, the payment. You break it down, like I was saying, and about that, um, you got to have it match ultimately to your 1099s. So waiting for the statement to come after the payment can be helpful for um, having the right amount in the printer's interest column and in the principal column. And then again, you calculate the ending balance and voila, loan records. So the last expense is um, depreciation. And so we'll talk about asset transactions. On the farm asset side, it's again, like I was saying earlier, not the asset purchase itself that goes on the Schedule F, it's the amount of depreciation that the purchase generates. And the total depreciation from that purchase will ultimately be the entire purchase price, but there are a variety of different um, methods by which you can calculate the depreciation to spread that out over years, to take that sooner. Um, so it's not the purchase of a tractor is not being deducted like chemicals or feed. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it impacts multiple years. Also, land doesn't depreciate. So um, if you buy land, there's no depreciation expense. Also raised livestock, that doesn't depreciate either. That's going to be um, an asset sale. But equipment, purchased breeding livestock, buildings improvements, that will all generate a um, depreciation expense. And there is a ton of options. Um, again, you can spread it over multiple years. There's guidelines for that and multiple choices. You can deduct a portion or the total amount in the year of purchase in many cases. That's called section 179, you might hear that term, um, and combinations of the two. I wanna mention again, when you purchase an asset with the loan, it if asset with, yep, asset with a loan, the um, asset purchase price is the entire amount of the asset. And then the loan is a portion and the cash portion. Um, so you want to make sure that you record the entire asset purchase um, so that the depreciation can be calculated accurately. So again, this kind of this tax plan, comprehensive tax planning is pretty important. From the farm records book, when you purchase an asset, you record the date, description, and total price um, so that you can get a an accurate description into your depreciation schedule. And then you can talk about depreciation choices with your tax preparer. Um, and then when you sell when you sell assets, you might do both of those in a year. You have, you potentially anyways, have a gain which may be taxable income. So we're talking about breeding livestock, equipment. We are talking about land, um, buildings, anything you would typically hold um, more than a year. The amount of gain depends on the sales price versus what is called the tax basis. And that depends on the original purchase price and the depreciation that you, you took on that asset. Um, so your gain is basically what's left of the sales price in comparison um, to this like remaining, this remaining tax basis. A lot of assets, their tax basis is zero because the depreciation was taken fairly quickly or because the asset was held for a very long time. And then the entire sales price is a gain. The type of gain, so that was the amount of gain, the type of gain depends on how long you held the asset. Um, so the gains may be taxed similar to net farm income, but without self-employment tax, um, or they may be subject to the lower capital gains rate. And this really depends on how long you held the asset. And then there's also depreciation recapture. And I'll talk a little bit about them. So, okay, if you hold an asset for less than a year, that is a short-term gain. And that's the one that you pay taxes on it like at the same rate as you would net farm income, but no self-employment tax. For assets you hold over a year, or in like cases of breeding livestock, it's two years. Those are long-term gains, and that's taxed at the capital gains rate, which might be 0% or 15%, depending on your total income. Um, a good reason to do some tax planning, because it's kind of it's kind of a complicated um, calculation, but it can come in very handy if you manage that well. Um, and the depreciation recapture has to do with assets that um, you sold and have already depreciated. Um, again, this is why tax preparers are, are wonderful. You just have to give them the information that they need in order to make these calculations. 
Uh, okay, so the capital gain or loss is going to go into the schedule, the form 1040 to be part of your adjusted gross income. And you can do all that in the farm record book. When you sell an asset, you need to record the date, asset description, and total amount of the asset. Um, and you want your what you want is your information to be clear enough that the accountant can or the tax preparer can locate it on your depreciation schedule and make all the necessary calculations. Okay, so we have made our way through each section of the business and how to record the different transactions. Um, and then we, as we talked, there's different places in the farm record book to record these transactions. There is cash going out of the business, like farm expenses, interest, depreciation in section one, cash coming into the business, go in various places in section two. And Florencia will talk more about the records book as a record keeping resource. Okay. So I will stop sharing my screen and Florencia can take it from here. Okay, I will. Um, actually was just answering a question and I'm gonna answer half of it and I'll let you answer the other half. Um, it was a question about tax preparers um, mm -hmm. and the part that I did not get to answering, and I thought maybe you would have a better idea than I do, is what is the average cost to hire a tax preparer? So if you want to just maybe type the answer on the Q&A while I get my screen going. Well, I can provide a quick answer okay. to that. Um, it can vary everything from a few hundred dollars to multiple thousands of dollars, depending on the complexity of your business and the quality of the records you give them. So the less time they have to spend on your tax return, the less the cost, but it's in the multiple hundreds to the multiple thousands. Thank you, Corey. And you should be seeing my screen now. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we are, um, Corey, before I um, start, I also answered a lot of questions, but if you want to look at them and add anything or answer any other questions that come up, uh, feel free, please, to do that. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, so now I'm going to show you in more detail how to get this farm records book for management that we've been talking to you about. Like we said before, this is a free tool to keep track of your farm income and expenses, and it can be used in Excel, Google Sheets, or just be printed off to fill out by hand. So um, you should open up a browser and type www.bit.ly forward slash farm records book in the address bar and hit enter. I entered that link on the answer to the very first question today. If you want to have, take that from the chat uh, or from the Q&A box. Um, and then the farm records book for management will open. This is a view only version for anyone who wants to use this book to be able to download. You will need to make a copy of the document in order to use it. If you prefer to use pen and paper, you can just print it from here by clicking on the printer icon at the top left. On the next screen, you'll need to select workbook instead of current sheet if you want to print the whole farm records book. Or if you prefer, you can just print sections one at a time by leaving current sheet selected. Make sure letter paper is selected and you should be ready to go. Hit next. And once you do that, you will see a second and more realistic preview of what it's actually going to print like. So here you can take a few moments to make sure that everything is fitting right on your pages. If it doesn't for any reason, contact me. Um, but if the formatting looks correct, which it should, you are ready to print. Just select your printer of choice and click on print. If you prefer to work on Microsoft Excel, you can download the file on, on your computer, go to file, download Microsoft Excel and an Excel copy will download on your computer. Once you do that, you can just open it and it will look pretty much exactly like the Google Sheets version. If you want to print from here after you have completed it with your records, you'll be able to do that, but you may need to make a couple minor page adjustments or you can just send the file to your text preparer if you would like. Your third option is to sign in with a Google account to use Google Sheets. 
Um, if you're signed in, you will have a couple more options. And the one that you should use is going to file, make a copy. You will be able to select which folder in your Google Drive to use. And once you do this, Google is going to create a new copy of this farm records book that is now going to be editable so that you can start entering your information. Then you can just print a copy or a print a filled in version. Same instructions as before. Another thing you can do from your copy of the farm records book is to share it if you're using Google Sheets. Um, is to share it with uh, a family member, your tax preparer. This copy of the farm records book will be fully privately yours. Nobody except those you choose will have access to your records. MSU extension uh, will not see any of that. So now uh, let's dive a little deeper into how to use this farm records book. If you have just downloaded it, uh, you can follow along or you can just watch the screen captures I have here on the presentation and take a look at it later. So the farm records book has 10 sections as outlined in the index, which is on the home page. On a daily basis, you're only going to deal with pages one through three. Corey has been talking about a bit about these pages, but we'll review some of it again in a minute. And then on a quarterly basis, you'll check your work on page four. Pages five and six have tables that resemble the most relevant tax forms so that you can estimate your taxes in December if, if you want to do that. And pages seven through 10 are dedicated to creating financial statements and financial analysis. This is a little more advanced, so we will not focus on this today, but just know that if you want to be able to do farm financial analysis, um, MSU Extension educators, like I said before, can create not only an income statement for you, but also a detailed financial analysis, as long as you're able to put together the information for pages four, seven, and eight, which are the cash flow statement, the production reports, and the balance sheet or net worth statement. I'm also updating this uh, book all the time. Um, so yeah, make sure that, I mean, as long as you go into that link, you will be getting the most updated version. Um, but if you have feedback about it, I'm happy to hear it. All right, each section starts with an explanation. So you can learn a lot by just reading all of that. Um, now we're gonna go through an example. Let's imagine I am a farmer and it's the beginning of July. And I am trying to finish up my second quarter records. I have already completed all of my first quarter work. So that means that I have gone up to page four for the first quarter. And as you can see at the bottom of page four, I have checked that my beginning balance plus my income my, minus my expenses are equal to my ending bank balance. So inflows equal outflows. Um, so now that I'm entering my uh, second quarter uh, information, I'm going to go back to page one and finish entering my June expenses, including at least date, amount, and what, what category it is. Then I am going to add up the categories for the month of June. As you see here, everything before June was already entered, and I'm working on the month of June. Then I have to add up the total expenses for June. I also have an employee, which was not counted in the above expenses, so I have to add that. I enter his gross pay and any deductions and withholdings on this table. And suppose I bought a truck. I have a business property section to enter this information. And if I would have borrowed or repaid any loans, I would also enter that in the last table of this page. Um, in this example, I don't have any, so um, this is empty. But suppose that all, all of those were my expenses for the month of June. Then I go to page two and I'm gonna enter my income, all of my sources of income. So I, again, I enter each transaction on a line, entering at least the date and amount, which with as much detail as possible. And then again, I add each category for the month of June. and come up with a total of operating expenses for June by adding all of those up. 
Suppose that I traded in an old truck when I bought the new one. I enter that in the sales of business property section where I can include some information about depreciation and all of this is explained in the instructions. Um, so now that I am done with the farm income and expenses, I can try to keep track of some personal expenses that may be relevant for tax deductions and adjustments at the end of the year. So this would go on page three. And while the farm records book does not have a place to track all of your personal income and expense transactions, and especially if you're a beginning farmer, you may have a lot of off-farm income or expenses that you may want to keep track of. My advice is that you try and keep track of your personal transactions just as good as you do your business transactions. Um, and like I said before, there are a lot of tools to make that easy for you. Um, but uh, the lo logic of the farm records book is to just basically calculate your personal expenses as a difference between what you had at the beginning and what you have now, taking into account any off-farm income, your farm income and expenses. It, it's just another way to do it. There's, there's more than why, one way uh, to do it. Uh, but either way, it is my belief that you should be able to you know, keep good track of your business expenses and keep good track of your personal expenses income as well. Okay, so that's page three. Once I've entered all of these transactions for June, I'm ready to go to page four and do my second quarter closeout. Since this is broken down by quarters and all I have calculated before is by month, I have to go back and add my April, May, and June transactions for each income and ex expense category and enter those totals in the second column of page four. Once I do that, I'm going to go to the bottom table and I'm going to enter my beginning and ending cash balances. And I'm basically going to do the math to see if I have accounted for everything and if it jives. This will be the moment to enter transactions that have not been accounted for um, up to this point, such as any non-farm income and expenses, gifts, inheritances, savings, that type of thing. So going back to taxes, page five of the farm records book copies Schedule F so that you can try and estimate and manage your taxes at the end of the year. If you have been using the farm records book, you should have all the necessary information for that form. Your tax preparer can also do that for you if you want to do that. Page six of the farm records book copies the information requested in form 1040, schedule one, schedule A, and schedule S, E. Note that these are not official, so these would be like the personal forms. Uh, uh, note that these are not official forms, the, one, the ones on the farm records book. Um, you may need to file more than these few forms as well. So these are just the most common ones to help you make an estimation at the end of the year. So this is all I had for you today. Um, let's see if we have any more questions. Corey, I see you added some stuff. So that's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I see you answered next. So thank you for that. Okay. If you all have any more questions, please write them in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer them now. I see that there's a number of beginning farmers on the webinar and we will send some resources, informational type resources that you can take a look through in the follow-up email. Yes, yes. I've put a lot of links um, on, the, on one of my answers, but I'll try to add that to the follow-up email as well. Okay, well, there's another one that came in. Do the farm. Uh, hold on. Here it is. Do the farm books apply for different states? I don't see why it wouldn't. Yes, because of all of the, all of the tax categories and query... Uh, if, if you know differently, let me know. But um, 
all of the categories that we are using for the farm records book are the federal tax categories. So uh, every state is subject to the same categories for their federal taxes. Uh, yeah, the, the state with the farm records book design for federal taxes, most states start from like adjusted gross income or start from farm income in their, their state records, their state tax requirements. And you would look for that in order to use the tax records from the, or use the records from the farm records book. Um, so there's, the farm records book doesn't apply to any particular state. Mm -hmm. Right. There is another one. Does the Excel worksheet carry totals over to pages or do we need to calculate totals to carry to monthly page? Um, the farm records book for management, so the one that I like showed at the end, that one does not have any formulas. So it is up to you to forward or enter formulas, which is, you know, if you are familiar with formulas, my, my logic for not entering formulas there is that is um, supposed to be a simple tool for those that are uh, on, are doing record keeping on paper on paper or, you know, something very simple. So I, I didn't want to make it complicated. If you are familiar with formulas, you should be able to make the formulas yourself. Uh, if you are not familiar with formulas, having formulas there would just make your life more complicated. So that's the reason why I didn't use formulas uh, on the farm records book. There is the other um, book, the one called Farm Cash Tracker, and the link is on the very first answer. Um, to the very first question, uh, you can look into that one. That one has a lot of formulas if, if you want something a little more automatic. And if you want, you can also contact me and we can try to put something together. I, you know, I like spreadsheets. I like formulas. Uh, so I would love to work with you on that, but not everybody does. So there's another question about some production uh, software type um, apps. And there is a ton of opportunities for software on the production side as well as on the financial side. We do have a beginning farmer program um, that puts resources together for um, beginning farmers. And there's probably some information that um, can be located on that. It's kind of beyond the scope of what we can talk about within this webinar, but we will provide links to um, the beginning farmer resources through MSU Extension, as well as some of the other resources. So we'll address that. Do you mean, uh, Corey, the Beginning Farmer webinar series? We have both the Beginning Farmer webinar series and the publications of the, what's called the Demand series. It stands for, I have no idea, so, something about beginning managers and stuff. It's odd. But it's a really good series with a lot of really good information. Yeah. So for the Beginning Farmer webinar series, I put the link on my second answer. Mm -hmm. Um, but I didn't put the demand series, uh, link. So, uh, I'll, I'll make sure to add that to the follow-up email. Um, okay. Looks like those were all of the questions that came in so far. And you're welcome to contact either one of us, um, with further questions. That's fine. And there's also, maybe I can quickly go back to the map where there's, you, you know, you can at least see the faces of the other folks around the state if you feel like somebody else would be closer to you. Not that that matters a lot in the world that we're living in now, but here we've got Frank, Stan, Roger, and John. Okay, we still have a couple minutes, but it seems like no more questions are coming in. So we'll, we'll probably just let people go. Thank you, everyone. Oh, actually something just popped in. I took the beginning. You're welcome, Erica. Um, and Cornelius says, I took the beginning farmer webinar series, but no one was able to give me any information for farm apps. Farm apps, yeah. 
Yeah, the production apps. We'll get you in touch with the person that works with production and right. um, uh, the Beginning Farmer series, and you can we'll get to you some information about that. Right. It will depend on what type of farm you have. What, do we know that of uh, Cornelius? Uh, did he say that on another? Cornelius, please tell us what type of farm you have. Uh, and that will help us directly direct you to somebody who is a specialist in that type of production. You can just email that to me later because <laughs> it is uh, 10 a.m. now. Uh, and so we'll Thank let you guys everybody for coming. go. Thank you. Bye.